Support for this program is provided by Good afternoon, I'm Stephen Henderson, and welcome to our American Black Journal and Bridge Detroit Town Hall on the Detroit Walk to Freedom 60 years later. Thanks for taking a break in the middle of your afternoon to join us for this really important conversation about two historic events in the civil rights movement, the Detroit Walk to Freedom and the March on Washington, which took place a couple of months later. I want to say a couple things before we get started. First, I really want to offer positive healing thoughts to my friend Malik Shabazz, who is facing a serious health crisis right now. I don't think you can talk about African-American activism or the push for equality and justice for Detroiters, all Detroiters, without thinking of Malik. This community needs him, and we at American Black Journal really hope earnestly for his recovery. I also want to talk just a little bit about Dr. King, what he was fighting for in 1963 when he was here in Detroit and in Washington, and what we're still fighting for now. Today, especially, I think there's dark irony in the invocation of Dr. King and his work in this city. You've seen and maybe smell the air in Southeast Michigan today. It is hazy, it is foul, it is dangerous. And yes, that's affecting all of us in some way, but I think we have to acknowledge and understand the way this kind of pollution and its consequences lean into the construct of the very inequalities that Dr. King was fighting against. For many of us, this kind of error just means stay indoors, spend as little time outside as you can. But for so many others, it means something much more. What about people whose work doesn't allow them to be inside today? They're going to be outside, breathing in the dirty air. What about people who have to care for others? Staying home maybe isn't an option. You've got to get from one place to another. You've got to get to your loved ones or someone else you care for to make sure they're okay. Now you're exposed. And what about people who live in parts of the city where, well, the air is already fouled by industry and its pollution? The discomforting levels of pollution for some people reach a new level of danger for those folks. And we know from history, from practice, from the present, that so many of those who are experiencing this in a disparate way are black and brown and they're poor. Dr. King said more than once that an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The uneven and discriminatory experiences that will surround the way we deal with the smoke and the haze that is visiting with us is a stark and really disappointing reminder of how much his work remains undone. We really need to take care of ourselves while this goes on. But just as important, we need to stop and think about the ways this really highlights the undone work of Dr. King, the things that we need to pay rapt attention to all the time. And we also need to reach out to the people we know who will suffer more than other folks to make sure they're all right, we need to do what we can to help. All right, we're gonna get started. And over the next hour, we're gonna talk about the significance and the impact of the marches 
and how far we have come since 1963. We want you to join in the conversation as well. So make sure to submit your questions for our panelists in the comments section. Let's get started with highlights of this past weekend's Detroit NAACP Commemorative Freedom Walk and the unveiling of a Dr. Martin Luther King statue in our own Hart Plaza. Take a look. Years ago, Martin Luther King Jr. would lead at least 125,000 down Woodward Avenue from Adelaide and Woodward all the way to where we're standing right now in what is known as the Detroit Walk to Freedom. That march was organized by the Detroit Council for Human Rights, which was led by Reverend C.L. Franklin. And of course, if you don't know C.L., you probably know his daughter, the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin. Reverend Albert Clegg, who will become the founder of the Shrine of the Black Madonna and change his name to Jeremoji Abebe Ajiman. Benjamin McFall, the owner of McFall Brothers Funeral Homes, and James Del Rio, who will go on to become a judge. They would lead that march in conjunction with the UAW, which of course was led by Walter Ruther, the mayor of the city of Detroit at that time, Jerome Cavanaugh. And they will lead that 125,000 people down here. And Martin Luther King Jr. at what was then Cobo Arena would give a speech, a 30-minute speech. And at the end of that speech, he would leave a crescendo of the I have a dream refrain. Organized labor and the civil rights movement are inextricably intertwined. You know, we stand together. And it is a great, great prestigious honor to be a part of this. I hope that as you step out into the street this morning, you are making a commitment, a commitment to organize our community. This is a generational moment, and it's personal for me. My father marched 60 years ago as a six-year-old in this march. You see people banning books. People want to ban the book that talks about Dr. King. This march would not be acceptable in Florida under the current government, under the current legislature. 1963! Hello, hello. Why is it a little known fact that Dr. King rehearsed the I Have a Dream speech here in the I city know. of Detroit first before he took it to Right, DC? well you know how it is, man. You, you know, you're getting your, you're getting your sing on at one place before you go sing. Uh, you're working it out. Yeah, that's right, you're working out the kinks and stuff. And this ain't no small place, Detroit. If you can do it in Detroit, then you can withstand all kinds of critique because people here are rigorous about performance, <laughs> about intelligence, about oratory and the like. You can never stop marching. You know, it's critically important though that we have fixed policy to protest. Mm. Protest without policy is pure performance. Charity, you were intentional with bringing your daughter here, why? Absolutely. Um, well, she has to see this in action. And she also gets to see mom at work in a number of ways. She also needs to see mom marching down. And she, she needs to get the opportunity so that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, she'll be able to say she participated in the march as one of the first steps toward her own fight for freedom for all of us. This is commemorating the, the um, downtown Detroit downtown walk from Woodward to um, Copa Hall in 1963. And of course, that's Aretha Franklin and Dr. King. And I was six years old when I was in the first march in 63. So you were in the original march in Yes, my dad. My dad brought me. This is what the march seems look like. 60 years later from the March for Freedom that Martin Luther King, Reverend C.O. Franklin, and so many others put on, how does it feel to be here 60 years later? Well, you know, my husband was at the first march and when you would talk to him about what the most important work he ever did was he would say this work the civil rights work what do we want freedom when do we want it freedom ain't free and we have to continue to march continue to agitate and continue to put our hands to the plow to ensure that all black and brown people, not just in Detroit, but in the entire country, has an opportunity to experience life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. My favorite quote was, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We never forget that. Sacrifice crusaders, predestined for greater, no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. There's a huge portrait behind my desk of Dr. King and this march in 1963. I keep it there as a reminder of the promise of the dream 
but also a reminder of what happens when you don't honor that dream. I look at that picture and think just four years later, this city erupted in violence that we still haven't recovered from. And as you look to your left and you look to your right, and particularly to the young people, remember this day. Remember the experience. Carry the dream forward. We are the dream that the dreamers dreamed. And I'm here today to announce that in the state of Michigan, when we've seen the Federal Voting Rights Act weakened time and time again, when we've seen people show up outside this convention center trying to stop the counting of votes of valid Detroiters, trying to intimidate people from participating in our democracy, we say in Michigan we're going to take the lead and fight back. That's what King's Dream is about, and that's why we were proud to introduce this week a Voting Rights Act for the state of Michigan. I dream of a world where we don't have to fight day after day to have our voices heard. But I know I can't create that world on my own. It's up to all of us to take active parts in making our world a better place for the younger generations. Let us be the generation that shatters the chains of injustice, discrimination, and oppression. We have the power to shape the future. Let us march with courage and resilience and with the unwavering belief that a briar tomorrow is within our reach. Together, let's make Dr. King's dream our own. Our thanks to One Detroit, to Bill Kubota, for putting together those really powerful moments from the Detroit NAACP's June Jubilee celebration, and to Orlando Bailey of Bridge Detroit for the interviews. We're going to see him a little later in the town hall. But my first guest attended the 1963 Walk to Freedom and had a front row seat to the civil rights movement through his father. I'd like to welcome Reverend Horace Sheffield III, who is the CEO of the Detroit Association of Black Organizations, also known as DABO, to the program. Horace, welcome to the town hall. Good to see you again, my friend. And uh, that was pretty chilling. Yeah. Uh, yeah. About those moments in those days. Yeah. Yeah. So you were a young boy when this march happened and you attended the Walk to Freedom here in Detroit. Take us back. Uh, what do you remember about that day? Well, actually, you know, my exposure to the civil rights movement began before that. My dad took me uh, everywhere. You know, I was sat in on planning meetings for the March on Washington that was held in Washington. Uh, a. Philip Randolph, all those folks were people that I knew. And because of my dad's work and his exposure to violence and the, and the unsafe conditions, I mean, I, I lived the civil rights movement. I mean, I, I was as much a, um, uh, you know, a nonviolent uh, participant in that, in that movement as anyone. I mean, it, it was in the ethos of who I was. So for Dr. King to come to Detroit, uh, where I had seen him else places, it's really resonated with me for a variety of reasons. One, I was very familiar with restrictive covenants. I, I, we grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, the only neighborhood where you know blacks could live pretty much at one point on the west side. Uh, I knew about stress, well not stress at that time it was the big four, uh, with black Plymouth furries with you know machine guns in the back window. So to me, it was Dr. King coming to not only address what was going on in the South but also the experiences of discrimination, segregation uh, that we had experienced in the North. Um, uh, talk a little more about that particular day and the, the feeling that people had, the thousands of people who were out in the streets uh, with Dr. King. The, the pictures suggest this uh, feeling of triumph and of momentum that was yeah. building and of course building toward the march in Washington later that fall. But 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 give us a sense of how that how that all felt. Well, you know, my great grandmother had been a slave. She lived in Detroit. She died in 1962. And when I look at those photos, I think about the pride of those people, man, who were factory workers and little education, no education, came from an agrarian south, but yet they had suits and ties. They had a, a belief in 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 what we were told. Uh, were the four freedoms and the liberties and all that. So I remember that. I remember, you know, the aspirations of my grandparents and, and my great grandmother uh, that one day things would be better for black folks. Um, that was the life my father lived. But to be honest with you, Stephen, uh, what was most compelling with me on that day, people know me 
know this, that I talk about how I believe I was called to preach that day because I had known Dr. King in a private sense. Uh, 224 Sunset is his house in Atlanta. Been there. I mean, you you name it. Uh, but that day when he spoke and being near him, uh, I asked myself what man or man this is. And the spirit is not the man for what you see is flesh and blood. But what makes him great is my spirit in the man. And I said, well, can I have a portion of that? He said, seek my face. I said, thy face will I see. I mean, I was completely mesmerized. I'm telling you, Stephen, when he leaned forward, they would they would sit back. When he when he leaned backwards, they would move forward. I'd never seen anyone in my whole life orchestrate uh, that kind of momentum, that kind of zeal in people. And 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 what's important because we can contrast that with Trump is what he was trying to get them to do. The end of it was not violence, was not disruption but to get this country to live up to the true meaning of its creed that we hold it, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that was powerful. I mean, I, I don't think anyone who's never been in the room with him and heard him speak will ever experience. I mean, I know people have a good time in church. I do too. Uh, but there's, there's nothing ever in my life that can compare to standing near him and watching him do that and, and see the influence he commanded over that audience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, lots of people are familiar with the work you do now. I'd love to have you talk about how that work connects with those experiences you had during the civil rights movement and the things that you see now that are still undone, the things that we need to be focused on uh, to fulfill Dr. King's dream uh, of, of, of America. Well, the success of the of the uh, civil rights movement really can be attributable to the success of the black labor movement. You know, my dad and, and people like Buddy Ballow and, and I could mention so many more were able to transform a pile of bricks into a cathedral, they organized. And that's what Dr. King needed, either through Baird Rustin or through others. And so, you know, I've inherited that work through Dable and my dad, you know, who want to create that kind of infrastructure that was necessary to continue uh, to move, you know, in a direction of gaining more rights and more freedoms for people of color. I think today, to be perfectly honest with you, and, and people can assess why this happened, you know, post Obama, you know, they had to restrain themselves for eight years and now the cat's back out the box. But we live, we live in a time that has the potential for the same kind of virulent racism uh, that that um, that that cause water hoses and dogs to be sick on folk. They just do it in a completely different way. I've never thought in my life that I would see this many white folks uh, who are willing to just throw out the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and anything else that would get in their way of being able to to maintain power uh, in an undemocratic way. So that's where we are, and I think if we're not careful. Uh, people are running around having fun and you know celebrating Juneteenth, which I did. Mm -hmm. But we got to find a way to get people of good conscience. My dad said, if enough people of all colors and good conscience can come together, then we can do anything we need to do, including defeating this 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 rapid and rampant rise of sexism, of racism, and bigotry that we see in our country today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we all know how small of a place Detroit is and how strong the connections are between all of us who've been here for any uh, for any length of time. Um, I want to talk just a bit about the connection uh, between you, Horace, and, and, and me. Uh, my grandfather, William Beckham Sr., was a close friend and associate of your Absolutely. fathers. They were both involved in getting this march uh, in 1963 with Dr. King at the center. Uh, it's one of those things that reminds you of the power of history around here and the call, I think, that comes to all of us from where we come from. Well, you know, one of the things that was interesting, I was going to sneak it in, to see my daughter unveil that statue, mm -hmm. given her grandfather's history, uh, was more touching to me mm. anything because that's what my dad fought for. He fought for us five plus one, you know, you're, you're Mr. Beckham. I mean, when, 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 when the 
police were beating us on our heads and disrespecting us. They came up with five plus one. Jerry Cavanaugh, liberal mayor, five liberal council persons. I mean, we've come a long way, man. And, and I think it is black labor, still black labor, that has the potential of helping us organize to overcome every malady and every threat that we uh, have. I think, you know, we're blessed in Detroit. We've not had, you know, a whole lot of craziness go on. But I think we can attribute that to people like your grandfather and my father. And I can mention so many, uh, Leon, Leon Cole, uh, you know, uh, uh, Daisy Elliott fighting uh, Rosetta Ferguson, Dave Holmes. I mean, these were the people, by the way, who could disagree, disagree on, on the practice, but agreed on the principle. Yep. And that's what we got to get back to again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Horace Sheffield III. Yeah. Always great to see you, man. And uh, thanks so much for joining us on the town hall. Thank you. A reminder to viewers that if you want to take part in this conversation, all you got to do is put questions or comments in the chat and uh, we'll get to them during the discussion with our guests. Okay, up next, the 1963 Detroit Walk to Freedom made history as the largest civil rights demonstration at that time. It also marked the first time Dr. King delivered that early version of his really important I Have a Dream speech in a major city. Joining me now to talk about the significant event and how it came together is Detroit historian Ken Coleman. Ken, welcome to the town hall. Thank you for having me, Stephen. So I want to start with the backstory on yes. the march. Uh, we all see the pictures of the march and that kind of triumphant moment of Dr. King marching down Woodward Avenue in the city with so many people around him. It seems like uh, that's kind of uh, an easy uh, interpretation of, of, of what happened. This was not an easy thing to pull off, though. There was a lot that had to, to be negotiated and worked on to make that day happen. Tell us uh, the story. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks again for having me. Uh, the 1963 Walk to Freedom in Detroit um, was a, a, a work in progress, was an effort that really um, sort of started with the uh, Detroit Council for Human Rights, looking back 20 years before 1963. Uh, looking at 1943, uh, when uh, the city of Detroit suffered uh, a race riot, uh, civil unrest, and, and, and largely it was white people uh, attacking Blacks along Woodward Avenue mm -hmm. and in Black neighborhoods like uh, Black Bottom and Paradise Valley, two predominantly Black communities um, on the Lower East Side. Um, the Reverend C.L. Franklin um, one of the leaders in the 1963 march uh, was one of those people who moved to Detroit uh, in the 1940s. Consider this, Stephen, and for our viewers, uh, the reality is in 1940, Detroit was the fourth largest city in America, the fourth largest city in America. Only New York City, uh, Chicago, and Philadelphia were larger. Uh, in the decade of the 1940s, the city's black population doubled from about 149,000 people to 300,000 people. Uh, yet uh, African-Americans, far too many African-Americans in the city of Detroit uh, weren't uh, offered and granted the same level of, of, of equity that whites were. And so uh, Reverend Franklin and others, um, looking back 20 years uh, ago, uh, they were looking back in 1963 said, you know, we have we've made some progress. Um, we've had the first African American in Michigan elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, and Charles Diggs, um, in, in 1954. Uh, we've looked at 1957, and we realized that Bill Patrick uh, is the first Black member of the Detroit City Council, then called Common Council, the city's mm -hmm. legislative branch, uh, the first Black elected since the 1880s. But there were still social inequities. For example. The 5,000 member Detroit Police Department in 1963, the 5,000 member Detroit Police Department in 1963 had fewer than 300 African Americans on the force. Mm. Uh, and so there were serious inequities happening and that was the driver. Um, that was the fact, if you will, um, that Reverend Franklin and Reverend Clegg and, and Mr. McFall and others 
um, look at when they contemplated having the 1963 march. Yeah, yeah. And, and they had to work out some differences. I mean, the, the, that roster of names, <laughs> the thing they have in common is uh, that they were all for equality and they were all for uh, the struggle for equality. They had really different ideas about what that should look like, though. And, th and there was uh, some tension in figuring out what was the right way to make this statement in the, in the city of Detroit. There's no doubt, Stephen, uh, the Detroit Council for Human Rights was a short-lived a short organization. It had really just formed right before uh, the June 1963 march. And by the end of that year, um, there were tensions, uh, continued tensions between the leadership. And uh, hist historians are, are very clear that Reverend C.L. Franklin and Reverend Albert Clegg didn't always agree on everything, or at least the tactics um, uh, uh, around um, uh, demonstration and the like. Um, all the, a lot of us remember, and I think you probably remember as a reporter, uh, Jimmy Del Rio uh, mm -hmm. was a very fiery, <laughs> very fiery uh, 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 leader, to be sure. Uh, didn't always agree um, with with uh, with uh, black leadership. We also know that the Detroit branch NAACP did not support the 1963 Walk to Freedom. Uh, it certainly was doing great work, the branch was, doing great work in terms of uh, pushing back against uh, uh, discrimination in housing and unemployment. They did that. They had been doing that for decades and certainly did that in 1963, but did not support the march. On the other hand, uh, the city of Detroit got on board early. Uh, Mayor Jerry Cavanaugh, that Reverend Sheffield spoke to, um, the liberal uh, Irish Catholic Democrat, Mm -hmm. had just been elected mayor a couple of years before. Uh, he put he set forth a, a process that supported the march, um, worked with Common Council to get the permits to, to have the march be able uh, to happen. Uh, and so at least for one shining day uh, in June of 1963, all of these people uh, came together to support the effort. Yeah. And, and as I said earlier, 125,000 people showed up for this march. It was at that time, the largest march ever. Uh, why, why did that happen? Why did so many people show up? And talk about the power that that vested in the image and the idea of Dr. King as uh, a much bigger figure in the civil, civil rights movement. I feel like uh, there's momentum that gets built here in Detroit that he carries with him to Washington. And then of course, uh, to, to the other things that, that uh, he accomplishes. Well, it's a, it's a great point, Stephen. Uh, the 1963 Walk to Freedom in Detroit um, comes uh, nearly eight years after the successful uh, uh, Montgomery, uh, Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott uh, mm -hmm. of 1955. Uh, and so King, from that point, really becomes a major leader, uh, uh, certainly around civil rights in, in an America proper. Uh, wasn't wasn't as popular as he would come maybe years after 1963, but certainly is an attractive draw um, uh, for for African Americans and whites and others to 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 turn out on that day in June in 1963. But one of the things that I think a lot of people forget is that the great uh, civil rights leader uh, Medgar Evers of mm -hmm. the NAACP in Jackson, Mississippi, mm -hmm. Eggers had been assassinated. Mm -hmm. uh, murdered uh, only a couple of weeks before the, the 1963 Detroit March. That motivated a lot of people to come out. In fact, when we see the iconic photos of that march, um, there are many placards out in the sea of people on Woodward Avenue uh, holding uh, blacks and whites holding placards uh, that read, Medgar Evers died for you. Uh, and so with that in the backdrop, um, with race discrimination still being carried out uh, in Detroit of 125,000 people, which some of us believe is a conservative number, um, uh, turned out for that, 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 that civil rights uh, demonstration. Yeah, yeah. Peaceful demonstration, I should add. Peaceful demonstration, right? 125,000 people uh, peacefully making the case for, uh, for greater equality. Okay, uh, Ken Coleman, always appreciate the work that you do and the deep knowledge you have of our history. Thanks so much for joining us in the town. I appreciate it, friend. Thank you.
Okay, another reminder that uh, you can ask questions in the chat uh, wherever you are watching this town hall and we can uh, include them in our conversations with our guests. Our next guest was a young girl when she marched down Woodward Avenue in the 1963 walk. Two months later, she would also go to the March on Washington with her mother. I'd like to welcome Detroiter and community activist Edith Lee Payne. Edith, it is really great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And it's always great to see you as yeah. well. It's been a long time uh, because of the because of the disruption of the pandemic. I feel like all kinds of people I haven't seen in a really, a really long time. So I'm, I'm really yeah. glad that you could join us. Um, so let's start with you describing that June day in 1963. Uh, you marched down Woodward in the Walk to Freedom. What was that like? It was um, it was exciting for me to participate, you know, for my mother to take me while I was aware of the injustices that, that were happening in the South. Um, it gave me a sense of pride, of course, to, to be there and, you know, to walk with other people that obviously felt the same way. I didn't think then as I do now, but interestingly, as we walked down Woodward Avenue and I can recall now with the Woolworths and the SS Kreskis and, you know, places that we would go and off to a distance, Crawley's where my mom and I and others like us could come and sit and eat uh, at lunch counters served by black and white waitresses. People in the South couldn't do that. My mother knew and understood that, but I didn't. So more, as I said, more in retrospect, it gives me an even greater sense of pride that I was able to be there and um, and make that journey with others that wanted to see life, the quality of life, better for everybody. Yeah, uh, I mean, you were you were a, a child when this happened, but how aware were you of Dr. King and the civil rights movement and the things that were that were changing uh, at the demand of African Americans in America at that point? Well, actually, I was very aware of Dr. King because my mom sub subscribed, you know, and of course he made the news mm -hmm. and, and we did have a TV at that point, mm -hmm. um, but she subscribed to publications that had stories about him, the things that he participated in. I remember seeing the graphic uh, photo, or at least the, the funeral photo of, of Medgar Evers. I believe it was in a jet uh, magazine that well, that was one of the publications that she that she subscribed to. But also I would hear from my classmates because uh, I was 11 years old. So I would hear from my classmates, uh, either elementary or um, junior high, uh, the experiences they had when they would go home to the South and spend time with their grandparents or other family members having to uh, drink water from different from colored only uh, water fountains or, you know, the, the instances that they experienced just traveling on Southern roads and the precautions that people had to take. Thankfully, I never experienced that, but I could certainly feel, you know, what other people, from what other people expressed. That motivated me and gave me an even greater understanding of what was going on in the country that I lived in, uh, but only a few hundred miles separated us how it could be so different it was hard for an 11 year old girl to fathom, but mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, I knew it existed. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about later that year when your mother takes you with her to Washington to see Dr. King again and see him give basically the same speech that he gave here, but it's a much bigger stage. There are way more people. Uh, what was that like? That was also exciting. Let me say, hearing Dr. King's voice, um, he captivated you regardless to your age. Mm. Um, so to hear him a second time to participate in a march with, I couldn't tell that it was twice as many people because I was, I'm only five feet tall now, so I'm sure I was about 4'10 then. <laughs> um, but it was just you know, massive people all over. The difference though, with the Washington DC March, it was, I'm sure 20 degrees hotter 
um, hotter and humid, but I arrived early and we went to the Washington March because Dr. King asked us in Detroit to come in and join he and others. Uh, so we were there early because my aunt was a volunteer for the Red Cross. So we got there before all the buses and people started converging on, uh, on the mall. So, but it was amazing to see. And when I say early, I mean early in the morning because uh, we just had, she had to have her place. But to see busloads of people just converge on the mall and park and, and but the attitude of people, it, in spite of what we were going through, what people in the South were going through, it was, it was just, oh, let's see, how can I say it? It was encouraging. Mm. I'll say to see so many people from all walks of life, all races, all creeds come together. And mind you, that wasn't a new thing for me because mm -hmm. I'm in Detroit. Mm -hmm. So I've been to uh, the Olympia Stadium with blacks and whites. And my mother was a, a domestic. So being around white people and engaging with different nationalities, there wasn't a concern for me, fortunately, or, or for my mom. Uh, but it was still inspiring and encouraging, but especially to hear Dr. King's voice and his message is always so powerful and remains powerful and encouraging to me to this day. Yeah, yeah. So um, talk about how this influences the work that you do today in the community. You do an awful lot of things. Um, how much of that is drawn from these early experiences? Well, knowing where we are today compared to where we were 60 years ago, mm -hmm. not enough has changed. I won't say not a lot. A lot has changed. Um, but the need to help generations coming behind us to mm -hmm. find their place, to take their place, to keep things or to, to make things better for themselves as well as, those, as well as those coming behind them, I find to be not a challenge, but it was a different movement then. The, the civil rights movement had a foundation of, had a spiritual foundation. I would say 99% of the people that attended both marches went to church. They had a strong faith. And they knew that whatever it was that they did, they, they were fearless. They were courageous. Um, we didn't have the fear that something was going to happen to us. We were going to be hosed or, or anything like that. Um, but we knew that our courage came from higher authority, so to speak, mm -hmm. as Dr. King was a reverend to me more than he was just a speaker, mm -hmm. uh, since most of his speeches always referenced scripture. When you hear that kind of message, you get a different kind of encouragement and, and certainly fearlessness. People weren't afraid to die then. I'm not afraid to die now uh, because there's a cause, there's a reason, there's a purpose that we have to fulfill and we um, owe it to our four parents to uh, do whatever it is that we can to make sure that policing is what it should be, that housing is what it should be, that our schools, our children are properly educated. And sadly, those, those things still exist mm -hmm. now, that our corporations are good corporate citizens and not just there for the taking. Uh, so it, yes, there's, there's still a lot of work to be done, but, um, I'm still motivated by the same thing that I was motivated 60 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you do a lot of really wonderful work, of course, in our community, and we are grateful for your presence and of course uh, your effort. Uh, thanks so much for being here with us on the town hall. Thank you so much for having me. Another reminder that uh, you can ask us questions or talk with our guests in the chat, wherever you're watching this town hall. Okay, Dr. Martin Luther King was only 34 years old when he led these two massive marches in 1963. Here to talk more about his impact on people, both young and old, 
our Orlando Bailey, who is the engagement director at Bridge Detroit. Orlando, welcome to the town hall. Thanks, Stevie. And Reverend Kenneth Pierce II, who is first vice president of the Detroit branch of the NAACP and senior pastor at Hopewell Church. Reverend Pierce, welcome to the Thank town you. hall. Thank you. So uh, let's start with talking just a little about Dr. King's legacy and how it shows up in younger generations of people we have with us here in Detroit or around the nation uh, today. Orlando, I'll start with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start. I think we should remind everyone that the Montgomery Boys boycott happened in 1955 and Martin Luther King was chosen to lead that and he was only 25 years 25, old. I think yeah. that movement, uh, movements are birthed and carried by young people traditionally, especially when we talk about the civil rights age. And that is no different uh, than today, right? Here in the city of Detroit, we have so many amazing young people who take to the streets every day, but not only take to the streets, but take to the halls of uh, the city council chambers, take to the halls of the legislature in Lansing uh, to advance equitable policy that could uh, result in Detroit being a more thriving city that could result in Black people in Detroit having a, m a more better more better life. And so I think that the legacy endures. And I think what uh, is needed now and what was needed back then is for this intergenerational conversation to continue to happen, for young people not to be tone policed by our elders, but you know, helped and guided and, and propped up as elders uh, age in this movement um, and some gracefully age out. Uh, we have to look to our young people to begin to carry that torch and, and, you know, sort of do away with some of the respectability politics and identity politics that hold some young folks back. We have to do away with uh, this wait your turn mentality, right? Uh, if young folks have the consciousness and the mentality to advance equity, I say put them on the front lines and let them do it. And we at Bridge Detroit, um when we launched in uh, May of 2020, it was just a few weeks before the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, which of course sparked that summer of Black Lives Matter, really uh, building momentum and coming together. Here in Detroit in particular, it was young people, uh, young people who in many cases uh, were not well known before, uh, who, who stepped out in front and emerged as, as, as leaders there. I mean, I, I, I was absolutely blown away by the, the, the effort and the focus of the young people we saw, especially that summer. Oh, I mean, you know, absolutely. We covered uh, the protests here in the city of Detroit at Bridge Detroit, and it was a 100 consecutive days of protests led uh, by young people. And I think what um, what is so powerful about that and our coverage of it is that we had the opportunity as griots, as storytellers, to document that, right? I think right now what we are faced with in America beyond an assault on voting rights, beyond an assault on our lives, is this pushing of mass amnesia and erasure mm -hmm. right around some of the accomplishments and uh, things and fights that young people are taking up to advance uh, civil rights and so bridge detroit was out there on the front lines for 100 straight consecutive days <laughs> yes. covering that because it's important to document that and it's important that our young people who are developing a consciousness for this work and those who are even coming up in school uh, get to read about it and hear about it and see themselves reflected in movement. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Reverend Pierce, uh, Dr. King's leadership grows out of the church uh, and, and is rooted in the church throughout his, his life. Uh, talk about in a religious context today, the way you see that youth leadership stepping forward and coming together, uh, maybe in the same way. I agree with uh, what Orlando said in the beginning of his response, and that is that young people are um, beginning to um, speak up and step up. Um, in the church, um, I am proud to say that we're seeing more pastors um, begin to go back to using the pulpit to um, speak to the injustices that we see, to um, encourage the people that the church is still the forefront, as it always has been, of um, the social justice movement. 
Um, I think Dr. King really um, encouraged us all through his history and through what he, he fought for and what he stood for, um, that as pastors, we have more, um, more of our responsibility than just to um, encourage people, you know, part of the Bible, we, 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 we talk about and pray about, pray to and preach about a Jesus, a savior who was um, a fighter for the oppressed people. Um, and so we have that same responsibility. And Dr. King showed us that. And, I, and, and again, I'm proud to see that we are um, equipping and pouring into um, the generation and the church as it relates to making sure the social justice still remains at the forefront, even in the church. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little about Hopewell and what you see there. And in particular, what you see young people drawn to in terms of uh, the causes or the issues or the challenges that we still face uh, in our communities in Detroit. What do you hear from them about what motivates this idea that things can be better and they need to take the lead in making that happen? Absolutely. Um, I think we read more now, right? Um, we pay attention to uh, um, what's going on in and around our communities. And so I think when um, our generation, from what I hear from my congregants, when, when they see things going on in the community, when they see things going on around them, they are now triggered to talk. They're now mm -hmm. triggered to speak up and fight and fight in a respectful way unless we have to fight other ways, right? And so they are they are encouraged, they are eager to see the, the things that our grandparents taught us, the things that um, um, history has showed us, um, to not see that blood, sweat, and tears go, go to default. And so uh, when I talk to some of our congregants, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the injustices that we see, both directly in the community and higher up, um, it really triggers um, the fight that's within us. And so... Um, I'm excited about that. I'm very excited about that to see um, our generation not being quiet and really standing up and sticking up for what we believe in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or Orlando, a few months ago now, you convened a group of young Detroiters from all over the city uh, to come talk with you and others at Bridge Detroit uh, about violence and the effect that it has uh, on their lives. Uh, of course, a lot of people would say that the violence we face is also a civil rights issue uh, and, and something we need to be thinking of in, in that way to solve it. But, but I'm curious about some of the things you heard from the young people who were there uh, and the leadership that they were demonstrating as they were talking about these things uh, that, that, that affect them directly and every day in our community. Sure. Yeah. So we convened about 80 young people at Bridge Detroit for a conversation around public safety. And we worked with youth serving organizations, young people within youth serving organizations to convene uh, those young folks. And what we heard were really two things. I, I like to categorize it as two things. We heard about their transactional um, encounters with violence and how it has um, affected them in their lives, losing loved ones, brothers, cousins, uh, having loved ones in the carceral system, et cetera. But there was also a focus and an intention around addressing structures that breed violence in our communities. And so some of the young folks had a really keen sense around understanding and naming root causes that need to be addressed with policy. What we know about structural racism in, is that it is embedded within the blood vein of this country, right? And so we could talk about the siphoning off of resources and democracy and, and revenue sharing in the city of Detroit that causes large swaths of our city uh, to be poor and, and impoverished, right? And so what happens when you don't have a community that's well resourced? And young people really understood that and named that. Um, and called for sweeping change, sweeping change in school structures, sweeping change in, in ordinances uh, here uh, in the city of Detroit and sweeping change that would affect you know, the state legislature. And so I think when we talk about violence, it's important for us to name and for young people to have the consciousness to name some of the root causes that extend far beyond what behaviors are exhibited from my brother and my sister, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's so deep and we know that racism is smart and it continues to evolve, right? And so we have to continue to evolve, teach and change our language as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Reverend Pierce is the leader of a church and a congregation. I want to have you talk just a little about the things 
that uh, we need institutions to do and to build so that young people who have this leadership quality, who have uh, the drive to step out and, and try to make change uh, as young people so, so that it's easier for them. What, what, what are the things that institutions like yours are called to do to, to, to make this all work? Reach and teach. I think a lot, of, um, a lot of times we get stuck at teaching and we never reach out. Um, um, but the two go, go hand in hand. Um, if we teach more and then create opportunities where we can exercise what we've been taught, create opp opportunities where we can have a safe place to come and have things such as what we're doing today, a town hall where we can, we can speak up and um, um, speak about our concerns that we may be having, because some of our concerns uh, may not look like those of others. Mm -hmm. And so being able to come together um, institutions, churches, creating a safe place for for us to learn, grow, and then put all of those attributes, all of those tools that we we have been taught as it relates to social justice, as it relates to fighting against violence, as it relates to fighting against the injustice system, um, putting those opportunities together, those tools, and then you utilizing them um, in a tangible way, um, I think would be one step towards um, allowing our generation to be more free and comfortable in learning um, the process of which how to fight the proper way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I want to bring back the other guests that we've had here in the town hall uh, to take a couple of questions and, and continue the conversation here. Welcome back, Reverend Sheffield, Ken, and Edith. All right, uh, we do have a question that I want to put to everybody and just give people a chance to, to, to have at it if, if you've got a thought. Uh, it comes from Gerard on Facebook. He says, in light of the outward migration, particularly of middle-class African-Americans to the suburbs, how are we faring in Detroit uh, when it comes to taking care of the least of these? Uh, a biblical reference there, but also something that, that Dr. King was very focused on. How do we make sure that in the African-American community, we're focused on the challenges that people who are left behind, left behind by lots of forces and uh, uh, dynamics in our society, how we make sure we ha they have um, in our community, uh, make sure that they have what they need. Um, well, you know, Stephen, if I could chime in real quick. It's, yeah. it, you know, I don't know if I would define the least of these the same, for those being left behind. I mean, when we were in the minority in terms of population, we we're fighting to, to have representation on the police department, our voices in elected office. And here we are with the majority population and it's the same fight mm. uh, because in many ways we're being excluded from this Detroit 2.0. So I would think the least of these may be generational residents, mm. folks who've been here forever uh, contributing to a tax base that was declining folks who were discouraging other folks to be a part of this town. How do we make certain that those who never left are as included in those who just came back? Yeah. To me, that's the fight that we have today. Yeah. I think I think that Reverend Sheffield makes a great point. Um, the reality is um, that the, the city of Detroit has lost about a quarter of a million people. Uh, in the last 20, uh, 23 years. Um, uh, and a lot of those people, um, quite frankly, are middle class um, uh, or certainly working in middle class uh, African Americans. It, it looks as if uh, the Senate, I mean, the, the US census numbers are still sort of finalizing themselves, but it looks as if the city of Memphis in Tennessee um, will be the largest um, city with an African American majority. Mm -hmm. I've grown up in this town. Uh, I'm 55 years old, and I couldn't I couldn't fathom a day when Detroit wasn't the, the largest uh, majority black city uh, in the nation. But it looks like that's the case. On the other hand, there are um, great um, social action organizations uh, in Detroit. Uh, I covered a story for Michigan Advance about an organization called Detroit Action, which is doing a lot of uh, on the ground work, if you will. Um, a, a largely black and brown organization uh, in the city um, that's doing a lot of work around concerns around um, uh, energy costs and, and, and employment and the like. 
uh, and uh, opportun um, entrepreneurial opportunities. Um, so I think in some ways the future is bright, but we are not the same city, uh, mm -hmm. at least in terms of size and scope that we were um, when I started kindergarten uh, in Detroit Public Schools in 1973. <laughs> you know, the, the only thing that I would that I would add to, to Gerard's question, and I guess I'll give maybe a, a more a more practical answer. I think I would invoke Dr. King, Dr. King's tendency toward a beloved community. And one of the things that I think is required of anybody that's going to do anti-poverty work, uh, anti-racism work in the city of Detroit is to frame that work in love. I think what is happening and what we see in the city of Detroit, we still see a majority black city, right? And we still see uh, a structural racism uh, pervade. And that means that the face of structural racism sometimes has a black face. And we have to be careful um, about that. Just because we see folks in position doesn't mean that uh, they are fighting for equity and the advancement of Black people in the city of Detroit. And so what 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 we need to address, number one, is everybody who's in this space has to love the people first more than the practice. But secondly, be in community in conversation with people who are most impacted by social inequities because they are able to tell, they're experts in their experience and are able to tell those of us who have connections in our hands on the levers of power and those of us who are shepherding large amounts of capital, how to deploy it and what to do with it. I don't think we're doing enough listening, um, real yeah. active listening in this city. Yeah, I think in some ways, you know, you're, you're saying what I'm saying. I mean, I'm on Grand River, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. you know, I, mean, I, I deal with everyday folks every day. And I think that we give credence and we like to package that stuff. But I, I love this young man, Pastor Pierce. I mean, he's in my neighborhood. He's for real. We don't get a lot of that from a lot of people. I mean, let's we'll be honest. Most people are trying to get more than most, not deal with the folks who have nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And until we empower those people, right? I mean, it, 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 there's large numbers of poor people in Detroit. If they were politically astute and empowered, they wouldn't have to be begging for nothing. They could they get put in my dad's voter registration in uh, in Birmingham where the guy said, Look, I think like this, if we register everybody to vote, we ain't got to ask them for nothing. We just take it. <laughs> but you know, we have a class consciousness in Detroit. Let's let's be honest. And there are a lot of significant black folks that won't don't want to deal with poor black folks either. But I agree that the operative word is love. Because yeah. if you love your people, you serve your people and and you raise your people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're we're yeah, going to run out of time, but I want to give Edith and uh, Reverend Pierce a chance to, to answer. I just wanted to add something, being that I'm from the civil rights movement, and it's I say this all the time, Dr. King and, and those of us that came up during that movement believe that we should be judged by our character and not the color of our skin. What that means and, and what I see now more, or even in the 60s, or at least a, a segment, being, we people have a proclivity to segregate themselves as black people because they want to rest on the fact that I'm I'm a black female, I'm a black, you know, uh, their blackness, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the thing about that is that's obvious. But if you're just, um, you know, a, a woman and a man, as as the signs that the sanitation workers carried uh, in in Memphis. As, as proud as they were, they didn't have to define themselves by their color. They wanted to be equal and they wanted to be equal for who they were and, and what they were and whose they were. Um, but we tend to focus more on, well, I deserve this because I'm black. And that could be the case, but it's best if you deserve, whether it's housing, whether it's employment, you know, whatever it is, because of who you are and what you contribute, what you bring. And I'm not being anti-affirmative action. It has nothing to do with that. It's about recognizing who you are as an individual. So when you walk in a room, you're not looked at as being this, you know, intelligent Stephen Henderson, this black Stephen Henderson. You're Stephen Henderson, and it shouldn't matter what color you are. You're who you are. And I, I think when we focus too much on that, we get away from just who we are because we don't love ourselves for who we are. Mm -hmm. Reverend Pierce? And, and I agree with everything that was said, um, especially the love piece. 
um, there, there, there's no way we can change anything if we don't love on people first, right? Um, that's the core of, of, of what our Christianity is all about, loving on people, no matter what their color of their skin is, no matter their, their class um, status, loving on them. Um, I also think to Ken's point um, that we, we do have various community organizations and nonprofits and grassroots um, initiatives that have also been working to provide um, support and resources to the undeserved populations in Detroit. And so just realizing that there are some resources and there are some um, grassroots initiatives that are actually trying to help those um, that are in need of it as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was a really wonderful round of uh, answers to Gerard's questions. I couldn't have asked for uh, more, more perfect perspectives than, than those. I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for being here on our town hall, uh, Robin Sheffield, Ken, Edith, Orlando, and uh, Ken. That's right. I got everybody there. <laughs> Thanks for being here, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so thank you. much. All right, that's going to do it. Journal and Bridge Detroit Town Hall on the Walk to Freedom 60 Years Later. We really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. You can tell us what you thought about today's town hall by taking a short survey that's located in the comment section. And look for our continuing coverage on these two milestone events in the civil rights movement on American Black Journal and in Bridge Detroit. I'm Stephen Henderson. Take care and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided by 